All right, this is the uh, eighth in a series of messages called Beginnings, based on the book of Genesis. Genesis answers many of the big questions of life. How did the world come to be? Where did we come from? What is our purpose? Uh, Why is the world in such a mess? Whether you're a teenager or an empty nester, single or married, you have to know how you're going to answer those questions. The Bible begins not with Genesis, but with the empty tomb. If Jesus had died on the cross but not been raised from the dead, his life would not have been worth documenting. But because he was raised from the dead, at least four authors wrote narratives about the life of Christ. Twenty-three other authors or other books were written in what's called the New Testament, And so there are 27 books written there. It was written in Koine Greek. Koine Greek was the the common language uh, that that nearly everybody spoke. Uh, It was the, the, the language worldwide for educated people. That's why the gospel was able to spread and grow so quickly as people could read the The Greek. Well, then uh, Gentiles, as they became Christians, they became curious in the Hebrew scriptures. Never before had there been this interest. Uh, Their interest was not in becoming converted to Judaism, but they wanted to hear the backstory of Christ, the prophecies that that pointed to Jesus Christ. And so they began to to study the Hebrew Bible. There are 39 books in this. You say, well, how could they read it? How could they read Hebrew? Well, they couldn't. And, uh, but fortunately, in 300 B.C., scholars got together to translate the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures into Koine Greek. And so we had the Old Testament and the New Testament, and those became combined in what we know today as the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and this has now been translated into languages all over the world. The first line in Genesis says, in the beginning. Dan Size pulled me aside two weeks ago and said, how come you haven't mentioned the emphasis the Bible has on baseball? I said, oh? He says, yeah, in the big inning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, The universe hasn't always existed. The earth did not create itself. God created it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. The universe didn't create you. You didn't evolve from some primordial slime. God created you in his image. You were made with a mind, you can think. You were made with emotions, you can feel. You have a soul and a spirit so you can communicate with God. You are made in God's image, and so is every other human being on this world. So you're to treat them well. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. You're not to worship nature. You're not to worship animals. You're to rule over them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Here we begin to see our purpose. We are to have children and fill the earth. Whenever you hear calls today for people to no longer have children, there's too many people in the world, know that that's in direct opposition to God's command. He wants us to fill the earth and rule over it. We're to use the minds God has given us to master the universe. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. All that God created was good. So what happened? God put the first human beings, Adam and Eve, in the garden to take care of it. They could eat from many of the trees God had given them to eat, but they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan 
who Revelation tells us rebelled against God and a third of the angels in heaven went with him, was cast down to earth to rule over it until Christ comes again. He enticed Eve and Adam to disobey God and take from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Through that act of disobedience, sin entered the world. Since that first sin, human beings are all born with a sin nature. The natural proclivity to not trust God and to think that if we're going to get what we need to thrive, we have to take matters into our own hands. Our sin and the activity of Satan is the explanation for all the evil we see in the world. Genesis 4 tells us that the world began to get worse, and we witness the first human murder. Cain killed Abel. God says, where's your brother Abel? He says, I don't know. Haven't seen him. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to watch out for my little brother every day of the week? The answer is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Since all people are made in the image of God, we are to take care of each other. Genesis 5 to 8 informs us that the world grew even more evil All mankind was filled with violence and corruption, except Noah. So God decided to do a do-over. He would wipe out all mankind through a worldwide flood, except Noah and his family. You say, well, is that fair? To just wipe out everybody? Well, last week, Chris told us that uh, the, the building of the ark may have taken as much as 100 years. You know, they had to draw up the architectural drawings. They had to get through the planning commission at the county. That probably took half the time right there. And then the build. And so there was plenty of opportunity for people to say, Noah, what are you doing? He said, there's going to be a flood. I'm building a boat. But they laughed him off. And they ignored him. They had plenty of time to turn back to God. Maybe you're not a follower of Christ. You say, this is one of the reasons I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in God. Who would want to follow a God who would destroy all mankind through a flood? I get it. But you have to understand this pattern of human sinning and God judging And then offering a way of redemption occurs over and over again. It's repeated throughout the Bible. God judged the world, and then he made a way for a new world to begin through Noah's family. After the flood, God gave a new covenant with Noah. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 9 in your Bibles, or you can use the Bibles under the seats. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. This is the same command he gave to Adam and Eve. Genesis 10 tells us that Noah's family grew and developed and reproduced, and people spread rapidly throughout the earth. As far as we can tell, up the Mediterranean, up to Turkey, up the coast of Spain, east into the Middle East, down to Egypt, into Africa, and into Ethiopia. One of the questions uh, I received uh, one week was, how can there be so many different races in the world if we all came from Adam and Eve? Uh, A possible explanation is that Noah's sons, or uh, Noah's sons' wives came from uh, different races. As Moses wraps up this brief overview of the early history of mankind to make it at least relatively complete, In Genesis 11, he explains how we got so many languages. So turn to Genesis 11. What Moses tells us is not found in any other ancient documents. There are some, but they are like 2nd century B.C. and 3rd century A.D. Uh, Mankind is not like remembering things in history that are less than honorable. But Scripture records all important events with strict impartiality. One of the reasons you can believe in the Bible is because God reports the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. 
From this account, I think our takeaway today is that God graciously intervenes in our lives. Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Uh, They found a level plain that was very fertile in what's called Babylonia. Human population had grown steadily from the flood. We estimate that there were about 30,000 people at this time. Uh, They were spread around the world, but they were concentrated, most of them, in Shinar. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. They didn't want to rely on rocks, which are uneven. They wanted to use bricks because they wanted to build high. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower. Uh, now we begin to see where they, the people begin to go awry. Uh, the people are all amped up about building a tower. Notice that two times in verses 3 to 4, it says, come, let us build. They're, 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 they're excited and they want everybody to join in with them. This is going to be great. From this account, we don't just learn how we got many languages. We also learn how we can go awry with God. One way we can go awry with God is by trying to get to heaven without God. The reason the people were so excited to build a tower was to build it to the heavens. Verse 4, they said, come, let us build tower ourselves, a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, reaches to the heavens. Now we see their motive. They had their architects, their structural engineers, their builders, They're masons, all excited about how they could build this tower into the heavens. We all have this inborn uh, proclivity to want to turn our backs on God and take things into our own hands. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, Satan deceives them and says, if you eat from this fruit of this tree, you'll be enlightened and you'll become like God. And so they thought, wow, we could be enlightened. We don't need God anymore. Same thing here. We'll build this tower into heaven. (coughs) We can get to heaven uh, without God. Um, Remember, the whole mess we see in the world is caused by our human sin and the activity of Satan and the spiritual forces of evil. You can be sure that spiritual forces of evil were buzzing around and, and, and urging people on with this project. And uh, there would be a place you can be sure to, to worship at the top of the tower. Not God, of course, but an idol representing the spiritual forces of evil. Demonic forces are behind all attempts to get to heaven without God. One of the most popular ones today is to, to say, you know, I'm not perfect. I do some good things. I'm not as bad as some other people. I'm sure God will let me into heaven. I've done enough good. A second way we can go awry with God is by trying to make a name for ourselves so that we may make a name for ourselves. They didn't just want to get to heaven without obeying God's commands. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to build something so epic so huge that they would become famous. Everybody would remember them. Maybe the architect and the builder would have their names on a plaque at the, as you enter into the tower. Whenever we try to make a name for ourselves, we fall flat. We'll be humiliated. Uh, did I ever tell you about my $1,500 mistake? About 15 years ago, we had a lot of cars in our family. <clears throat> Jory and I each had a car. Tad had just graduated from law school, and he was living at home for a while. He had a car. David uh, had just graduated from medical school, and he had gotten married. He and his wife, Holly, each had cars. Uh, Luke had a truck. Joel had a truck. And Luke's girlfriend was over a lot, and she had a car. So we had eight cars. So I pulled everybody together one day and I said, hey, look, we can't have anybody park on the driveway behind the bays to the garage. 
We don't even want anybody backing out, hitting another car, doing something stupid. So we have kind of a drive through. I say, I want all you guys to park on the, you know, circle driveway. Okay, great. A couple days later, I pull out of the, the bay in the garage early in the morning. It's dark, and I just kind of head up the hill. Boom! I hit Tad's car. $1,000 deductible on mine, $500 deductible on his. Out the window. When you start to think, you know, it can never happen to me, watch out. If you see your kids w- wanting to get famous uh, and beginning to get proud, proud about what they're doing, remind them that their purpose in life is not to bring fame to themselves, but to God. A third way we can go awry with God is when we're trying to do something in defiance of God's word. God told Noah and his family to reproduce and replenish the earth. They were to have families and spread out over the earth. But notice what the people were saying. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They wanted to build their city and their tower so they would not be scattered over the earth. Just the opposite of what God told Noah. Chapter 9 God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. God's commands are always for our good. God wanted them to spread out. He wanted us to uh, manage all the animals worldwide and all of nature. Whenever we think we know better than God, we're substituting our opinions for God's. Back to chapter 11, verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. This is what we call an anthropomorphism. <coughs> God obviously can, can see uh, the whole earth. He doesn't need to come down. But Moses makes him like a man coming down to inspect the tower God allow things to, to, to take their course for a while, but then he came to inspect things. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible to them. God foresees with all people having one language, their ability to come up with even more pernicious plans to accomplish things uh, without him, that things will get worse in the world. And worse undertakings will follow. It can't be but harmful to let things go on, so God intervenes. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Uh, We don't deserve the beautiful world God has given us, so there's no point in having a defiant human family deserve the unifying medium of one language. So the Lord scattered them from there over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Um, People could no longer understand each other, so they stopped building, and they began to move elsewhere. They called the place Babel. God confused their language. It then became known as the city of Babylon. Things were getting bad, going worse, so God intervened. Uh, This gives us insight into how God works in the world. When we see things and we see things are, are, are bad and it seems like they're getting worse, recognize that God is sovereign. He can step in anytime he feels he needs to. And so we don't need to be biting our nails. Now, I've shared with you three ways we can go awry with God. I want to share one more thing with you. God is gracious. Uh, God let the situation in Shinar go on for some time, but to prevent mankind from further injuring himself, <clears throat> God finally stepped in. He figured it was better to have the division of many languages rather than to have collective apostasy. Confusing their tongues then ultimately was an act of his grace. 
my senior year in college, I been, began dating a girl, and she worked with me at Valley Community Presbyterian Church, just a few miles down the road here, and she worked with high school girls. Uh, at the end of that, that summer, I went off to seminary in Chicago. And uh, if things had kept going the way they were, I imagine we would have gotten married. I came home, I came back to Portland to see her uh, at Christmas. We had a wonderful four days together, and on the last night we exchanged gifts. And then she said, I think we should put the brakes on the relationship. I thought, okay, we'll slow the love train down a little bit. I didn't realize she was talking about slamming the brakes, and this was goodbye. She was dumping me. Can you imagine a girl doing that to me? So I went back to Chicago in January, and every day I remember getting on my knees next to my bed and saying, God, please help us get back together. This went on for two months, me walking around, moping, feeling sorry for myself. I was going to school. I was leading a young life club there, but I was really feeling bad. Well, one day as I was on my knees praying, I read Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you? I learned maybe for the first time that God only gives good gifts. So if you're asking him for something and it's not happening, maybe he's got a better idea. And so I said that day, okay, God, this is obviously not working out. So I tell you what. I am willing to be single the rest of my life. And I got up from my knees that day and I quit feeling sorry for myself. Two months later, I called Young Life and I said, you know, this Young Life Club has grown like from 20 to 200 kids. I need another girl leader. And so I said, okay, we'll send her to your, uh, your, your leaders meeting. And up the stairs walked Jory. And I'll tell you, it was love at first sight. <laughs> and now as I look back, and, uh, you know, I, she is far better suited for me than the other gal would have been. I mean, Jory is such a good person. I tell her this all the time. I don't know anybody that's more good than her. She's just pure in her motives. And she's kind to people, even people that are mean to her. And she's so smart. She went to a meeting at the planning committee in Lake Oswego the other day, and they, they didn't like some of her uh, plans, and she came back with questions, and they said, nobody's ever asked us that before. She is a wonderful wife. We could never have nine kids without her. You know, I'm type A, driven. It would have been horrible. She's relaxed. God intervened. He had a better person for me. God graciously intervenes in our lives. Confusing people's language, languages so they could no longer understand each other may seem harsh. But it was gracious when you realize that if God hadn't stepped in, things would have gotten worse. Throughout the Bible, we see God graciously intervenes in our lives. When things got so bad... He intervened with a worldwide flood and started over a new family with Noah's family. It was ultimately an act of grace. He intervened here again at Babel. And he intervened when he sent his son into the world. He saw that we didn't have any hope unless his son died for our sins and took the penalty on his shoulders So that if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, we can have new life. And God will put his Holy Spirit inside us and begin to change us to become like Christ. And God continues to graciously intervene in your life. Maybe he's intervening right now in your life. He has caused things to happen in your life. Maybe you've met someone that invited you to come to church here. He's inviting you to give you a chance to turn things around in your life and commit your life to Christ. Or maybe recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you grew up with the church, but you've drifted away from it, and he's wanting you to come back. 
you can experience God's gracious intervention in your life today. Father, we thank you for this passage where we see how you intervene in our lives for our good. It's never for our bad. You are a gracious God. And we thank you for interventions in our life where you've kept us from going off the rails, where you've directed us back to see that we need you. We need you in our lives. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you could do it right now. Just tell Christ you believe he's the son of God, he was raised from the dead, and you want him in your life. Or maybe you want him back in your life. You've drifted. I want to give you all a chance right now to thank God for his gracious interventions in your life. You pray. Lord God, thank you for your love for us, your grace, grace, your gracious interventions. And we celebrate your intervention, sending Christ into this world to die for all of our sins. And so we worship you and thank you as we celebrate Holy Communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.